attacked by panthers, wolves, and Indians. And it is a true story that took place a long time ago. A contributor to the New York Sun vouches for the truth of the following story. In the spring of 1868, my father, deceived by falsehoods of land speculators, as many others, removed from the comfortable home in Ontario and bought a tract of land on the west shore of Lake Wood, Lake of the Woods, within the Canadian Territory. At the time my story opens, I was a lad of only 12 years old. We had a clearing of three or four acres, had built a stout house, and though much discouraged by adverse circumstances, had no thought of giving up the farm when a terrible calamity happened. My mother's sister, a young woman about 30 years of age, had come into the wilderness with us as a member of the family. On, November, on a November day, the same being warm and pleasant, Father took Mother out to the lake for a ride in a canoe that he had bought from an Indian. They passed out, uh, out of sight among the small islands, and we never saw them again. It is believed by some that they were upset and drowned by others that they landed on an island and were killed by wild Indians. This then was our situation. We were eight miles from any other settler with a long hard winter coming our way. I was old enough to realize our position but not to advise. Aunt Hannah was naturally very quiet. And I remember how pale she was and, and what a, a look of anxiety that carried on her face as she came to realize that father and mother must be dead. She and I tramped around the, the lake for miles, but all to no pur purpose. If she had decided on leaving our cabin and going to the, the nearest settlement, she waited too long. A week after father and mother set out for that ride, the Indian summer came to an end. Now a severe storm set in, and uh, then it would have been impossible get out of the woods on account of the depth of the snow. When Aunt Hannah uh, realized this, she took an inventory of all the stock that we had on hand. And Father was fond of hunting, and he had brought uh, with him a fine rifle, a double barrel shotgun, a revolver, and plenty of ammunition. It, in addition, uh, we had 12 steel traps and two bear traps. As to provisions, well, we had uh, cornmeal, a little salt pork, and some coffee. Now, Father had been intending to go into the settlement and bring in a load of provisions for the winter. Our livestock consisted of a yoke of oxen, a cow, three pigs, and a dozen fowls. And none of them had been distributed by, by wild, uh, disturbed by wild beasts during the summer. And winter had only set in, however, when our oxen were run off, either by Indians or by wolves. And they were lost to us forever. And a bear came one night and carried off one of the pigs, and the next day we killed the other two and hung their carcasses up to freeze. We intended to kill all the, all the poultry, but foxes and wolverines saved us from the trouble. The first of December, when the snow was at least four feet deep on the ground and the thermometer stood uh, far below zero, we had nothing to care for outdoors. Now, from the 1st to the 12th of December, it was so cold that water would freeze at the door of our cabin, 14 feet of, of, blazing, of a blazing fire, but it still froze. The frost got into the logs and, and kept a constant popping, and the snow kept falling at intervals until it finally banked up higher than the windows and shut out all of the light. The morning of the 13th, the weather became milder, and before noon, it was thawing considerably, but when we had cleared away the snow then dragged up a new supply of wood, Aunt Hannah got down uh, the firearms and she said to us, We must clean and load these weapons for we shall soon have unwelcome visitors. It will freeze tonight, making a strong crust on the snow, and tomorrow the wild beasts will be able to move about. There were only two small windows to the cabin, and these were guarded with stout wooden shutters. A loophole had been left in the, in the casing, each side of the door and windows, and these were stopped with, pe with pegs. And the door was a plank, hung on wooden hinges, and secured by a bar. And there was a crevice at the bottom, at least two inches wide, and this had stopped when cold weather came with a piece of a board. It froze up solid again that night, and the, the 14th was cold and cloudy, and, and uh, nothing had been able to move through the deep snow and the beasts were pretty ravenous. 
A little past nine o'clock in the morning, we started or were startled by a long drawn scream at the door, and my aunt whispered that our, our visitor was a panther. Five minutes later, we discovered that there were two panthers. Five minutes later, we discovered that there were uh, three panthers. There were no doubt, they were no doubt ravenously hungry and could scent not only us, but the fresh pork hanging near the door. And they mounted to the roof, tried the, the door and, and the shutters, and now and then fought each other in disappointment. And we kept, our, we kept quiet for a while, hoping that they would go away. But as they persisted in their efforts, Aunt Hannah planned a revenge. She cut off several small pieces of the fresh meat, and when I had pulled the, do the board away from the crevice at the door, she placed the pieces about six inches away, and then she stood there with a sharp axe. The panthers sniffed and, and snuffed and directly thrust their paws under the door to seize the meat, and that was what she had expected, and she was ready. The at about noon, a large black bear circled around the cabin more than a dozen times, and after he came, after he came two wolves. But we remained quiet, and they soon went away. About three o'clock in the afternoon, my aunt told me to get out all the traps and explain we have more to fear from the wolves than anything else. I expect they will come by the score as soon as night falls. And we will set up all the traps, and those <clears throat> who get caught will at once be devoured by their companions. So we set the traps in the house and carried them out one by one and placed them in placed them on the frozen crust under the windows and in front of the door. And when that was done, we secured the door and waited. We waited for the night to come. Now it was about five o'clock in the afternoon. It was just fairly dark when we heard the noise of a hundred of voices singing in different keys. Now this was a far off at first, but it came rapidly nearer, accompanied by a sound as if as of a heavy wind blowing through the trees. And then our cabin was suddenly surrounded by wolves and pandemonium broke loose. We could not say whether there were a hundred or five hundred in, in the pack, uh, as each beast was making all the noise he possibly could, and they fell into the traps at once. And, <clears throat> and then the racket frightened, frightened us half to death, although we felt sure our defense was perfectly safe against any attack. Every wolf was attacked and devoured as soon as he, as soon as he got fast, and it was certain that every trap scored a victim. Fourteen wolves ought to have made a supper for the pack, even if they, they had numbered in the hundreds. But it did not seem to be the case. The living became even more demonstrative. They raced over the roof, leaped at the, at the shutters, and, and rushed at the door in a, in, a, in a body. And at length my aunt decided to try the plan which had worked so well in the case of the panthers. So she got out the axe cut off a piece of meat, and for the next 15 minutes we were busy slashing off paws. I suspected that every wolf who lost a paw was at once pounced upon and eaten, and I know at least 20 suffered in this way. By and by, the appetites of the living seemed to be satisfied. And after quarreling and racing around, the pack moved off, and when the snow melted in the spring, there were enough bones lying about the cabin to, re to represent 50 wolves. I believe they would have filled four or five barrels. And we had other adventures with wild beasts that winter. Indeed, it was still known locally as the Wolf Winter. But we had a more exciting time with the Indians. A band of them broke away from a reservation late in the fall and took to the woods and murdered many settlers. And it was about the first of March before we heard them. Then one day a hunter and Trapper called at the cabin and warned us to flee, stating that a band of, had broken up into small parties and was determined to murder every white person from the lake west to the Red River to the north. He himself had narrowly escaped death at their hands, and the snow was then three feet deep in the woods, and we might have to walk 30 miles to reach a place of safety. My aunt listened carefully to what the man had to say, and then replied, I shall stay right here, and if the Indians come, we will do our, our best to beat them off. The hunter left us uh, three, three bars of lead and about a pound of powder, and as soon as he had departed, we put the cabin in a state of siege. We brought a barrel of water from the creek, got in a lot of wood, and the, to, and the shutters to the windows were stri strengthened by breaking up a heavy chest. And that night a thaw set in and continued for two whole days. And when the weather changed, 
there was only three inches of snow on the ground. Nothing had been, been seen of the Indians, but Aunt Hannah said they would be sure to come now. And while I stood on a stump and watched, she set all the traps, as we had for the wolves, covering each one lightly with a coat of snow. And this turned out to be a very wise precaution. At 11 o'clock that night, while we were both sound asleep, a terrific yell suddenly rent the air and was almost instantly seconded by another. One of the bear traps had been set in front of the door and the other under the, one of the windows. A band of Indians had carefully approached the cabin and two of them had stepped into the traps at almost this very same instant. And Aunt Hannah's uh, uh, face was whiter than marble. But she had all of her presence of mind and she ordered me to take the revolver and fire through the portholes at the window while she used the shotgun at the door and from the yells and screams of the red men we were satisfied that two or three were badly wounded and even if none had been killed. They drew off and, and left us to reload and it was an hour before we heard anything more from them. Then one knocked on the door and a voice spoke to us in good English saying, Woman, for God's sake, let us in. I have been a prisoner with the Indians, but have just escaped. I am wounded in the foot and cannot travel, but I, have, but I can help you fight. And I was for removing the bar at once, but my aunt stopped me with a gesture and tiptoed to one of the post holes and drew out the peg. My God, but you have no mercy, wailed the man. If captured, I, I shall be burned at the stake. There are twenty Indians here, but with my help, we can beat them off. And she put the muzzle of the revolver through the porthole, twisted it to the left, and then she fired. And the man fell against the door, recovered himself, and shouted out, I'll roast you alive for that, you she-devil, he hollered out. And he was, he was a white renegade or decoy, and she had wounded him in the shoulder. He retreated, cursing and growling, and we heard no more from the Indians until after the sunrise the very next morning. They had made a temporary camp under a bank about 30 rods off, and the first move was to advance with a flag of truce. And when the, the bearer got near enough, he said that if we would all surrender, we should be, be well treated and conducted to a white settlement. And uh, I, nor let me reply. This silence would puzzle them as to the strength, strength of the inmates, and the Redskins soon withdrew, and after a bit, fire was opened on the door. And, and on the door and the window shutters. Not a bullet went through. And about after an hour, the fire seemed to concentrate on the window opposite the door. And my aunt was quick to notice this, to notice this and took the shotgun, gave me the revolver, and she said, they're going to try to batter the door down. Don't fire until I give the word. So we had been at the po post holes for about five minutes when 10 Indians, to attract our attention from the door, approached and as the Indians stepped back for a start, and just as they were on the point of advancing, my aunt gave the word to fire, and there was a row of buckskinned legs right in front of me, and I couldn't help but hurt someone. When the smoke blew away, there were five Indians on the ground, and these soon crawled say, uh, say, away, wounded and bleeding, uh, but two, two had been killed by the fire of the shotgun. The survivors didn't try to get to the bodies, uh, but uh, they were trying to cut holes through the rough homemade shingles when some of the buckshot reached uh, and scattered them. They then built a fire against the logs, but it only scorched them, and soon after dinner, the party retreated, leaving two dead at the door, two more in the barn, and having to help away two or three wounded. And that night, the wolves came and devoured the dead, and we were saved the trouble of removing and burying them. And that's where the story stops. It doesn't say how they got out in the spring or what happened to them after that. But it's an interesting story of, of how wild the frontier was uh, back, in the, back in the day. You know, the Indians, uh, stories of that era, this, this came out, prob this was probably written in the 1700s. And when the story came out, everything was negative towards the Indians. But one thing people didn't uh, take into account was that what we did to the Indians, why they treated us in some ways so savagely. Later things calmed down somewhat and, and uh, whites and natives were able to live uh, in close proximity as, as cautious friends. But 
but these stories made it painted the Indians as if they were the total aggressor. And how can that be? We invaded their land. So I hope you enjoyed the story, and uh, thank you for stopping by. I love you all very much. I hope you know that. I think you should know that. And I'll be back with you again real, real soon with something else that I hope you'll find interesting. God bless each and every one of you on the other side of that steering screen. Stay well. God willing, I'll see you soon.